Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who the rabbits show respect to him and the chipmunks genuflect to him. Here is the captain. Yes, another new year in true crime. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring a seasonal beer called Cold Mountain from one of the very best brewers of fine beers in all of the land. And that would be Highland Brewing, of course, in beautiful Asheville, North Carolina. Now, I know that Highland is probably very close to selling out of this one, but I wanted to get this one on the show before the end of the season as this is absolutely one of the best holiday slash winter beers that I have had in a while. Cold Mountain is a spiced winter ale. This is a legendary winter warmer with a malt body and secret blend of spices. They have a version with coconut as well if you want to try that. Garage grade, four and a half bottle caps out of five. And let's give some praise and thank you to some of our friends for helping us fill up the fridge this week. First up, a cheers to Anna in Tacoma, Washington. And last but certainly not least, we have Brandon Dozier in Grapevine, Texas. Thanks to everyone who donated to the Beer Fund. If you would like to donate, you can do so at our website. Also, another great way to support the show is by checking out our store page where you can support the garage and get something awesome in return. Yeah, B-W-E-R-R-U-N, Beer Run. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. O'Fallon, Illinois, December 31st, 1999, New Year's Eve. 20-year-old Eastern Illinois University student Amy Blumberg was working a day shift at the on-stage dance apparel store. The store is a small standalone store owned by Amy's aunt and uncle. The store was located at 138 Eagle Drive, just a stone's throw from U.S. Highway 50, and not far at all from Interstate 64. It was the holiday season, and Amy was on winter break from her college courses at Eastern Illinois University. It was a Friday, and because it was New Year's Eve, it was expected to be a rather slow day at the dance store. Amy was working alone. Around 6 p.m., Amy's parents, Ken and Sue Blumberg, began receiving phone calls from Amy's friends. They were wondering where Amy was. Amy had plans to spend the evening with some of these friends to celebrate the new year. Her mother, Sue, made multiple calls to the store, trying to reach Amy without success. After a couple of hours, and with still no word from their daughter, they became increasingly concerned. They decided to drive to the store. The Blumbergs arrived at the store around 9 p.m. When they pulled into the lot, they observed Amy's car still parked in the lot. The lights were on inside the store. By now, the store should have been closed and Amy should have left long before 9 p.m. Amy's parents parked their vehicle and both of them hurried to the front door of the business. They found the door unlocked. After entering the store, Amy's parents saw blood on the door jamb of the entryway to the hall in the back of the store. Sue stayed in the front portion of the store and immediately called 911 to request an ambulance. Ken went to the back part of the store, where he encountered a tremendous amount of blood in the back hallway. Ken came back to the front part of the store and told Sue that they were too late. Then they went outside and waited until police arrived at the scene. 
This is True Crime Garage. New Year's Eve is a day when many choose to move on from the past year and look forward to the bright days in the new year to come. If last year wasn't your best year, well, don't worry about it. Next year will certainly be better. And if last year was great, well then get ready for maybe the best year of your life, all starting tomorrow. It's a day and night that is often celebrated with dancing, eating, drinking, singing, and sometimes even fireworks. The celebrations generally go on past midnight into January 1st, New Year's Day. Now, sadly, in eastern Illinois, for many, there was nothing to celebrate, only sorrow and grief. While many Americans were bracing for the Y2K scare, the Blumbergs were wondering what happened to their daughter and the O'Fallon Police Department just caught a murder investigation. Officers with the O'Fallon Police Department arrived on the scene shortly after 9 p.m. Officers Schaefer and Stover entered the store together. The store itself looked as they had expected. It looked normal, but behind a door on the left side of the store, they spotted blood. There was a trail of blood and blood spatter, on the floor of a small hallway behind this door. Down the hall, the first door was to the men's bathroom. The officers noticed a pool of blood on the floor of the bathroom. The hallway then continued to the right, where the blood trail continued as well. That hallway at the door to the women's bathroom. Inside this door, the officers found the body of a female on the floor. The officers checked for a pulse, confirmed that she was dead, and went outside to secure the scene. Unfortunately, the deceased was Amy Blumberg. She was born September 28, 1979. She was just 20 years old, a junior at Eastern Illinois University, taken way too soon by some unknown killer. Amy was survived by her parents and brother. In the coming days, hundreds gathered at the Grand Ballroom, and the Student Union at Eastern Illinois University. This was a memorial service for Amy, a room full of classmates, friends, and her sisters from Sigma Kappa. So many wonderful people had so many wonderful things to say and fond memories to share that day. Her mother said at the service that, quote, God will get us through this. Now, Captain, before we get into the investigation... I'd like to go through some of the evidence that was found and recovered at the crime scene. So back at the dance store, crime scene technicians arrived at the scene of the murder at 9.35 p.m. on December 31st, 1999. They immediately located a purse and keys on top of a counter in the store. The cash register in the store appeared to be undisturbed. They found blood on a door frame about one foot off of the floor leading to the hallway. Looking at the blood trail in the hallway, it appears that someone was dragged across the carpet towards the men's bathroom. In the men's bathroom, they located a pair of nylon pants, underwear, socks, and tennis shoes. Then the blood trail led from the men's room to the women's restroom. The victim's body was lying on the floor. She was nude from the waist down and bullet evidence was found at the scene. So what we have here, Captain, is when, unfortunately, the Blumbergs arrive at the dance store to look for their daughter, Amy. The first thing that they notice is that her vehicle is still in the parking lot and that the door to the business itself was unlocked. Right. From my understanding, when you walk into the store and scan the store, everything looked and appeared as normal. However, if you walked in further, you would start seeing signs of a struggle and seeing this blood trail in this hallway at the back of the store that would tell you something horrible had happened. And as we just described with this blood trail and what the police and technicians perception of this trail was that somebody was dragged, it looks like our victim, Amy was attacked 
and then possibly moved once or twice to where she is finally found in the women's restroom. Can you explain this dance store a little bit better for the listeners? It's a dance apparel store. I don't know everything that they sold, but that was their key product that they were peddling. And the store itself was relatively new. Again, this is not a holiday, but it's the day before a holiday. And as we see often, a lot of times we have shortened hours on days like this. And that was the case here from my understanding as well. But she was the only one working at this store at this time. Well, like you said, it was the day before a holiday, so it's shortened hours. So let's dive into the timeline of this case. Okay, using the experts' opinions and some known facts of the case, we can get a pretty firm timeline for the day in question. Now, we know that the door to the store was found unlocked when Amy's parents arrived at 9 p.m., but we can likely get rid of about three hours that are in question on this day here because of a couple of things. One, the store was scheduled to close at 6 p.m., Shortly after six, this is when Amy's parents are notified by at least one of Amy's friends that they could not get in touch with her. So whatever happened had to have happened before 6 p.m. or Amy would have just closed the store, left and went about her business for the day. Well, like you said, the door was unlocked. Her car was in the same position it was when she got there and no contact with friends or family through at least the telephone anyways. Yeah, so something would have happened at 6 p.m. or prior preventing Amy from closing the store and going with her friends. Also, there's a side note here that I think is key. Amy was given permission to close even earlier if the store was really slow. Now, the coroner gave an estimated time of death of 4 p.m., And we usually know that that's more of a window of time, less of an exact time. But using that, let's go through some of these other details. So we have the cash register, which showed the last sale was recorded for a $29.96 pair of black leotards. This was at 2.26 p.m. So if the coroner is correct, And the register is right. Mm -hmm. Well, then the killer was in the store sometime between 2.26 p.m. and roughly 4 p.m. as given the estimated time of death. So roughly an hour and a half window. We can go back before 2.26 p.m. before this recorded sale because we have, in this case, two eyewitnesses. We have a father and daughter. These are customers that were in the store that day. The gentleman's name is Leroy Yager. He told detectives that he and his daughter arrived at the on-stage store around 12.30 p.m. on December 31st, 1999. The purpose for the visit was to exchange a purchase for his daughter that was too small. When they arrived, this again at approximately 12.30 p.m., the store was closed with a sign indicating that the clerk would be returning soon. Leroy figures this was a lunch break. That makes sense given the time of day. So Leroy and his daughter went to lunch at a place nearby. When they returned to the store, the store was open. So the two walked in. This is when Leroy noticed a male customer who Leroy estimated to be in his 40s, looking through the clothing racks. Leroy's daughter then proceeded to try on several leotards until she found the correct size. Now, while doing so, Leroy was busy speaking with Amy, the solo store clerk at that time. Right. Leroy's daughter overheard the male customer ask Amy if they sold dance shoes in the store. Then the man left the store a short time after this. Then Leroy and his daughter, they complete their purchase, and then they left the store. But to be perfectly clear here, Leroy's purchase was not the 2.26 p.m. purchase in question. Right. Later that evening, when he learned that Amy had been found dead in the store, 
he contacted the O'Fallon Police Department, ultimately working with a sketch artist to create a likeness of the man he saw in the store. Obviously, police want to speak with this man because you have two situations that are possible. Either he's a potential eyewitness with additional information that they need, or he's somebody that they may want to consider as a person of interest or a suspect in this case. Yeah, because he could have came into the store by himself and basically surveillance the area. Leroy described the man's clothing as washed out jeans with a dark colored jacket. He recalled that the jacket reminded him of a ski coat. He also told police that there were two vehicles in the parking lot while they were there. And he described them as a black car and a maroon car. Remember, this is a standalone store that does not share a parking lot with other businesses. And the lot itself is rather small. So it's one of those situations, Captain, that you pull into the lot and you're pretty sure that the vehicles that you're seeing belong to the store. Either there are people working there or customers inside this store. When it seemed like Amy parked in the front of the store, which some stores are like that, there's no back parking for employees. Well, what we can figure out here is one of these vehicles is Amy's. So what we need to know is who does that other vehicle belong to? So as you can see, we are dealing with a short window of time here. We know that Leroy and his daughter did not go into the store until after 1230 p.m. because when they first arrived, the store was closed briefly. Right. He says that they had lunch. They went back to the store. So even conservatively, we're looking at probably at least 1 p.m., probably later, in fact, that they return to the store and they are in the store. Well, this is good for law enforcement that it's a standalone store with a standalone parking lot because you have people driving by that could give you some kind of account you hear on the news that this young girl's murdered. Maybe you drove by and saw which cars were in the parking lot around that time. So that is a good thing for law enforcement. And to close up our time, our window of time here even more, Again, we have Leroy and his daughter in the store. They're in the store long enough for Leroy to make several observations, to chit-chat with Amy, exchange their previous purchase, all before leaving. So now we are probably looking at 1.30 at the very earliest that they are departing the store. I think it's likely closer to 2 or maybe even 2.15. But to stay conservative, we can say Leroy left the store at 1.30 p.m., maybe later, and everything was fine at the time that he left. Then a sale recorded on the register at 2.26 p.m. Mm -hmm. So still business as usual, and then we have the estimated time of death is roughly 4 p.m. Kind of reminds you of a couple of other cases, doesn't it, Captain? Several that we have covered, in fact, here in the garage, but to keep it brief, I'm just going to name two real quick. One solved, that's the super bikes case, mm -hmm. and one unsolved yogurt shop where we have information from eyewitnesses, from persons, patrons at these businesses that are telling us one, the times that they were in the business and what they saw while they were there. Another thing going for law enforcement is Leroy is it, you're, you're not looking at Leroy as just an eyewitness at first you have to put him in the person of interest category but because they have such a solid timeline then they can quickly figure out if Leroy has an alibi because it's possible that Leroy goes to the store with his daughter and then comes back but I believe they were able to figure out that Leroy himself had an alibi for the time of where they think the murder took place. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I don't think that at any time they were looking at this individual as a suspect. What you have here is you have a, a conflict. And that conflict immediately is two things. You find this young woman working by herself at a store who is murdered. You have a short window of time of when that murder could have taken place. And now you're asking the public, hey, anybody that was at the store here that day, please come forward with information and, and help us out. You have two very different things. 
you have Leroy who was there with his daughter coming forward with helpful information mm-hmm. and you have an unknown man who is not coming forward with any information at all. I'm just saying that if I'm law enforcement, I'm going to do my due diligence and make sure that Leroy has an alibi for the time and make sure that he didn't have some conversation with this young girl and decide to come back. Well, of course. Yes. I, I would hope that they would be as diligent as you there, Captain. Well, somebody's a condescending dick today. It, it does very much remind me of both of those cases, super bikes and yogurt shop, because in both of those cases, we have detectives who are looking for that quote last customer or the very last person in the store before the shit hit the fan. Mm-hmm. We do have some of the autopsy information here in this case. They found several bruises on different portions of the body, indicating a struggle, signs that Amy defended herself. She was shot once at close range, or what is listed as an indeterminate range. Again, this was just one shot. It was an indeterminate range, but it is listed At a close range, there was an entry wound to the back of her left ear and an exit wound in front of her right ear. In the doctor's opinion, the bullet wound would have caused a rapid death. Well, we do have some forensic evidence, so let's dive into that. A red substance was found on the carpet in front of the cash register. This was determined to be human blood matching Amy's DNA. Blood and debris was found on a dress on a rack in the front of the store. Human blood was found on the hallway door frame, as we had already mentioned. There were several hairs that were collected from the body and the victim's clothing that did not belong to the victim. A hair was collected from the victim's right ankle. A single bullet was recovered from the scene. This was a 38 caliber bullet with six lands and grooves with a right twist. This particular bullet was from a 38 caliber class of bullets. And given the bullet's weight, design, and bearing surface, this bullet was consistent with a 38 automatic caliber bullet. Between the 38 caliber revolvers and the 38 caliber special derringers, there were 49 different possibilities for make and model of the gun that was used in this crime. Now, experts at the time, when asked how many of these types of guns were in circulation, they put the guess at, well, this would be in the millions, they said. It's fascinating how many different models and types of guns there are. So police needed a gun for comparison purposes with this bullet that they found. Mm -hmm. This wasn't a unique situation that was unique enough that they were able to really hone in on exactly the make and model that they were looking for. And police were also asking the public for help. As we said, they were looking for anybody that had been in the store that day And frankly, as you pointed out, Captain, do your due diligence. They're probably looking for anybody that had been in the store at any time at all if you want to come forward with any bit of information that you think was suspicious or of could be of some importance to the case. Right, and possibly, like I said before, the eyewitnesses driving by because we have a single store with a single parking lot. Did somebody somebody see a certain vehicle around 4 o'clock that could come forward and let you know. And then also there's some businesses around there. So what time did those employees get off? Did they notice anything out of the ordinary when it comes to the dance shop? Are you sick of dealing with psoriasis and an itchy scalp? Sick of scratching your head trying to figure out how to fix it? Check out Ocean Soothe, a natural solution that relieves psoriasis and problematic skin and scalp conditions. Sourced in Australia and manufactured in the USA, Ocean Soothe products deliver relief to the areas where you need it most. 
They offer a head-to-toe solution, so you don't need to put together a whole cocktail of products to treat your skin. The Ocean Soothe Gel and lotions are recognized by the National Psoriasis Foundation to relieve psoriasis and can be used across your whole body. They're naturally made, so you shouldn't experience any side effects. And they're odorless, so you can get relief without the stink. And no one wants to stink. For optimal psoriasis relief, start with Ocean Soothe Gel during the day, followed by Ocean Soothe Lotion at night. And if you want on-the-go relief for dandruff or dry, itchy scalp, The Ocean Soothe Scalp Serum is all you need. I absolutely love Ocean Soothe products. I use the Ocean Soothe Gel, so there's no stink and no itchy scalp. It's a complete game changer for me. It's worked for me, and I know it will work for you. Abundant, natural, health Ocean Soothe products are available at CVS Health Hub stores. Head over and shop today. You got New Year's goals, and HelloFresh is here to help you achieve them. Skip the grocery store and take control of your time and budget with delicious restaurant quality recipes delivered right to your door. If you're looking for an easy way to eat well and save money this year, HelloFresh is a great place to get started. It's cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% cheaper than takeout. With over 35 weekly recipes, they have the options you're looking for to help you achieve your goals. Choose calorie smart and carb smart recipes, or even customize select meals by swapping proteins or sides, upgrading your proteins, or adding protein to a veggie dish. HelloFresh's latest line of meals is fast and fresh recipes, featuring robust flavors and filling proportions that are ready in less than 15 minutes. Can you believe that? Ready in less than 15 minutes. I absolutely love HelloFresh. The Colonel loves HelloFresh. Why? Because HelloFresh saves us time and saves us money. It also makes us ninjas in the kitchen. So if you want to stay on track with your New Year's goals, check out HelloFresh. And you can do so by going to HelloFresh.com slash garage21 and use code 21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash garage21 with code garage21. For 21 free meals plus free shipping, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. All right, we are back. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers, everybody. A happy New Year's cheers to everybody out there. Yes. As we said, the police were asking the public for help in Amy's case. And specifically, they announced that they are looking for a white middle-aged man who was a customer in the dance shop the day of the murder. They described this individual as five feet, six inches to five foot, eight inches tall wearing blue jeans, a gray t-shirt, white tennis shoes, and a dark ski jacket. So police need your help. And then in this case, Captain, this is this is interesting. I, I love to see the different tactics that are used by different jurisdictions and what unique crimes generate different unique tactics. And this is something that's not terribly uncommon. But they set up a special 24-hour phone line. So this was a voicemail phone line that is set up to record tips for police and detectives. You could call any time of day, and you could leave any information that you want there. And because it's a voicemail, I'm guessing it's anonymous. Maybe they can track your or trace your, your call if they want. But... From my understanding, they were putting out the vibe to everybody that these are going to be anonymous, that you could call anonymously and leave your information. What they have here and what they bring in, and this is one thing that I think is paramount to any case. And I love when I see investigators and police departments doing this. They very quickly identify that this case is problematic for many reasons. And so they're not above calling in help. 
And so what they get here is they get 18 investigators from the greater St. Louis area from the major case squad who were assisting in the case. And the FBI was called in as well. In O'Fallon, they had a three detective unit that were all putting in very long hours to try to find the killer who the newspaper said shot Amy Blumberg in the head for no obvious reason on New Year's Eve. Police Captain Jim Stover said that the detectives will be working on the case as long as I need them and that overtime was not a concern. And in regards to the comment of shot for no obvious reason, I believe is warranted as the police were seeking not only a suspect, but they were trying to figure out a motive for this as well. Right. Per the information released to the public, the store was not robbed and Amy's car was found undisturbed in the parking lot of the dance store. But she was found nude from the waist down, so possible sexual motive. In just a couple of days, a $5,000 reward for information was put together. This was from donors. That reward would grow to over $18,000 within a couple of months. And then something happened that I'm sure many in the area were thinking might happen as the investigation dragged on. Right. Due to the lack of an obvious motive, detectives were looking into similar cases, 20 other murder cases, in fact, spanning from Maryland to Washington State. Specifically, they were checking into possible parallels with the one that was called the Interstate 70 or the I-70 killer. Well, because this dance shop, it's how far away from I-70? It's not terribly far, and it's also within the uh, range of states that these some of these killings were taking place. Similar descriptions of the individual. Exactly. So what we have here is the I-70 killer, eight years prior to Amy Bloomberg's murder, had shot and killed store clerks for no apparent reason along the same interstate in several states, including the St. Louis area which we are talking about the greater being very near the greater St. Louis area here with this case. And like the I-70 victims, Amy Blumberg was working alone in a low traffic specialty store. She was shot once in the head in the middle of the afternoon. The store was not robbed. Captain Stover is quoted as saying, we have no evidence whatsoever to indicate that this homicide is related to the I-70 murders. But on the other hand, we have no evidence that it is not. There are a lot of things that are similar and a lot of things that are dissimilar, end quote. Right. Just to fill everybody in, in case anybody's wondering, the I-70 killer is a still unidentified serial killer that is known to have killed six store clerks in the Midwest in the spring of 1992. The nickname derives from the fact that several of the stores in which The victims worked were located a few miles off of Interstate 70. His victims were usually young women. All of the stores attacked were specialty stores and were usually only robbed of very small amounts of cash. He is also suspected of shooting three more store clerks in Texas during 1993 and 1994, one of which survived. Also, there is a 2001 murder of a store clerk in Terre Haute, Indiana. This is believed to possibly be connected to the I-70 case as well. Due to the lack of leads in Amy's case, and given the similarities in these scenarios, Amy's case was easy to try to fit in with the I-70 cases. Well, and if you're not following us on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, what are you doing with your life? We'll put a composite sketch of the I-70 killer on our social media. Now the I 70 killer case has been covered extensively. The case was featured on unsolved mysteries, America's most wanted and dark minds. And as said, the killer is yet to be identified and police have not publicly identified any suspects save, but one. And we'll get to that here in a bit. Now in Amy's case, the O'Fallon police department did release two composite sketches of persons that they would like to talk to along with those descriptions given one of which was the male customer seen in the dance store 
And the other was of a man that was seen in a nearby store behaving suspiciously on the same day of the shooting. So I want to be clear here because this is a little bit difficult. These are two composite sketches that they're putting out at the same time. Right. And the police are telling you this one is given from one eyewitness who says, I saw this man in the dance store. This is what he looked like on the day in question. The other is from a separate eyewitness at a different location that says this man who looks like this description was behaving weird that day. Apparently there was a guy in some business and I, I want to say that it was a real estate office. I, I had it in my notes somewhere here, captain, but I can't find it at the moment, but the interaction was strange because the person was saying this was a, a female eyewitness says this man approached me and he kept asking if I was alone or if there was anybody else in the building. And then he left. Now the caveat here that police are throwing out to the public is look, we're not saying that this guy is the same guy, but does it mean it's not right? right. They're, they're saying he could be the same guy, but we want you to be well aware that these are two descriptions coming They're They're actually similar descriptions. Right. These are two descriptions coming from two different eyewitnesses that were at two different locations at different times of the day. So they're, they're throwing out that, that warning that buyer beware to, to the public that this could be the same person. It also could not be the same person. So don't lock in on that too much and don't bother yourself with that too much. We just want to know if you can, Mr. Public, come forward with any information on either of these composite sketch drawings. What I do know from doing this podcast for so many years, there's so many cases where it's washed out jeans and some dark colored jacket. Uh, that is not the look that I'm ever going to go for. Ever. Well, it's just like the Delphi case. You have people right. coming forward. They're like, uh, this man must have must be responsible because he was wearing a blue jacket and jeans. Um, newsflash, most of America wears a blue jacket and jeans. Most men in their thirties or forties in America at nineteen ninety nine were wearing dark jackets and jeans. So while this individual Leroy and his daughter are trying to be very helpful. Unfortunately, the clothing is pretty much nondescript. Well, yeah, because this is like the uniform of the guy that has given up. Like, I, I just wear my old faded jeans and, and some jacket, some dark jacket. That's it. You just described me, although I've not <laughs> given up, but I've, I'm also not giving up my fucking jeans or, or black sh jacket. Here's some interesting things, though, Captain, and these may all be coincidental, the mm -hmm. dance apparel store was relatively new. And these are like just some sad, again, when we cover these, you find these little tidbits of information that just make the story even more tragic and even more happenstance, right? That this is, is almost a little more random. The dance apparel store was relatively new. Again, it's a small building itself and only about a year old. The business is only about a year old at the time of the crime. And it never opens again after Amy is killed. And in fact, they put it on the real estate market one month after the murder. Doors never open up again. So it's listed for sale in early February of 2000. Amy was the owner's niece. She was only working there because she's on winter break from college and likely covering and working by herself on a day that they were expecting very low traffic and probably very few customers at all. So Amy is killed on the last day of 1999. By early March 2000, police had ditched the two composite sketches of the men that they wanted to interview. Now, I've said this plenty of times here in the Garage Captain. I am a fan of the composite sketches as they always generate a lot of calls and a lot of information coming into police, but the big problem always seems to be the same. People have a tendency to hyperbolize these sketches. Right. I know this sounds like I'm stating the obvious, but it, it clearly is not so obvious to the masses. So I'll say it anyway. 
it's not a picture. It's not a photograph of the suspect. In this case, it's just a sketch of persons that law enforcement want to identify and interview. It's not a picture. It's a sketch of a person as described by another person with a fallible memory who is doing their best to, to piece together the likeness of this individual that they saw at a time when they didn't know they were supposed to be paying so much attention to everything. But also we have cases where we actually have photographs, but maybe the, maybe the photograph is a little bit blurry or pixelated. So it's hard to make out an in individual, like you said, uh, the composite sketches, I think it's a good thing. I think having a picture is a great thing too, but I think sometimes it, it, it leads to people going, they're trying to help, but they go, Oh, I, I got a, I got a buddy that lives out of state. It's never even been in this state, but he kind of looks like that guy. I should probably call. So I think there, it becomes sometimes that they actually get too many leads. Right. And I'm not trying to fault the eyewitnesses for trying to help. They are simply giving a description of someone that they saw often, you know, th this case, thankfully with Leroy, he's calling in that night. Right. And he's, so it's a little more recent, but oftentimes we're talking about somebody trying to give a description of someone that they saw 24, 48, 72 hours earlier when they themselves were just going about everyday normal activities. So often these witnesses, they do not know or would not have any way of knowing that they are looking at someone that at a later time, it might be important to be able to describe that person in great detail. And when I worked at the bank, this is something that we actually did to practice. They would give us a scenario and maybe it was on video footage and we were told to pay attention. And then we were told to give the best description as we could. And yes, if you do it more often, more frequent, you get better at it. But it's pretty astonishing how bad some people are. Well, and then when we talk about, yes, it's great because a lot of information comes in, a lot of tips, a lot of calls come in, but the reverse of that is you have to take into consideration this. Would anybody like to try to come up with an accurate over and under number for the tips, calls, email submissions, and social media side-by-sides that were wrong in the Delphi case? Right. How about the hundreds of tips called in in 1989, 1990, and 91 in the Amy Mahalovic case, which still is yet to see an arrest? Here, police did the right thing. This is something that I've not seen done very often. We've seen it once or twice, but they are forced to scrap the composite and not just scrap the composite. They come out and they tell the public, please disregard and forget about the composites that we released. The key, they said at the same time, is to focus heavy on the physical description that we gave out. So thanks for calling in, but the guy you were calling about that looks just like the sketch in the Mahalovic case, the suspect lives in California. Well, he cannot be the abductor and killer if he physically was not in Bay Village, Ohio in 1989. And that's one of the things that we've had to deal with when we go do a live event or we go to a conference, somebody would come up and go, I think the killer is this guy. And the description of the killer is let's say five, six to five, 10. Mm -hmm. And the person that they think was the killer is six, four. Mm -hmm. And you start by going, well, I think you, you need to, especially when there's a picture, you need to be able to match the picture, but then also, like you said, match the description. And that was the problem, the exact problem that they were having here, right? Like, just like you said, if, if we're looking for a guy that, that is of this description, well, then if you're calling about some guy that's four foot, two inches or some guy that's six foot, 10 inches tall, you're calling us with the wrong person. And that was the problem with the sketch in the Amy Blumberg case. And in this case, Captain Stover is telling the public, look, Thank you people for coming forward with information. However, we're scrapping these composite sketches and we're telling you public to forget about it because tipsters that are calling in have been focusing solely on the face of this right. composite sketch and totally ignoring other details of the man's general description. 
And he says, look, we are spending a lot of time and working a lot of leads from people who look at the composite, but do not look at the description. So they're showing up to talk to some guy that yes, his face might match that very general face that's in the sketch, but very quickly they can look at the guy and tell from any number of other reasons that this is probably not a great lead. We spent our time driving out here to meet this person. We are wasting resources at the time when we're, we got this case with, with this, uh, essentially, even though they never announced it, but we talked about the major K squad persons from the greater St. Louis area assisting and the FBI calling in. So essentially what you have here is a task force in the early days and months of this investigation. But also know thyself. Don't go around and act like an expert if you're not. And some of these people, look, all the people that I met that gave me some far <laughs> out there suspects to look into in, in plenty of uh, cases that we've covered, they all mean well. They just don't really understand that they have no clue what they're talking about. On the one year anniversary of the murder, the case was still unsolved and it looks like the leads had pretty much dried up at that point. The tip line did receive a lot of calls and a lot of incoming information early on. Most of the calls were tips and leads on persons who, who were resembled the composite sketch. None of those panned out. In that year to come, the police interviewed, they said they interviewed more than 225 people that all knew Amy and the same one common theme that they found throughout all of those interviews, Captain, was we interviewed 225 people and came up with zero enemies for our victim. And so they, they come out and they say, look, we can tell from everybody we spoke to that Amy was wholesome. She was energetic. She was well-liked. She was kind and fun-loving. Her friends called her Blums. And police were now actively telling the public, we believe this was a stranger killing. That was what they were calling it, a stranger killing. They were focusing their search for a suspect on similar killings in other cities and states, like we said earlier with the I-70 cases. Sue Blumberg told the Bellevue News Democrat, quote, that's what makes this difficult to believe even after a year. Why would somebody do this to a person they don't even know? End quote. Police said that the FBI profilers in Quantico were adding to their study whenever the O'Fallon Police Department fed them new information. Well, it's so, proof that there's just evil people out there. O'Fallon Police Department come up with this theory after working the case very hard that this is probably a stranger killing, and we don't have any of the experts to disagree with them. We have the major case squad unit, and we have the FBI agents in Quantico who seem to be all on board with this theory that O'Fallon Police Department are now using and working in Amy's case. So this will bring us up to two years into the investigation. The reward fund stopped growing by this point, Captain. Now we're sitting at about $20,000, and the calls to the tip line were rare at this point. Sue Blumberg, after the case was open, still open, the second year, stated that it's in God's hands now. When the time is right, something will happen. Well, sadly, let's go out another year. Then we get to three years later, three years after the murder. By this time, the tip line had gone silent, but police had not. They told the Bellevue News Democrat, there's somebody out there who knows something, and people eventually talk. We are still looking for the last customer at the store that day who bought a black leotard around 2.30 p.m., we can't tell the size because they didn't keep track of that. And Detective Jay Stanley had one last thing to say on the matter. Quote, it's personal now. We've become very close to Sue and Ken Blumberg, Amy's parents, and we would like to close this. What's not clear, Captain, in Leroy's statement, 
And I'd like to go back to the statement here because now we can see three years later and it seems like it always has been from the get go that a heavy focus and rightfully and rightfully so is on this last customer. But what's not clear about Leroy's statement to me, and I'm sure it probably was to police at the time because I'm sure they spoke with him extensively and on multiple occasions. But if both of these vehicles were parked in the lot, when he and his daughter were in the store, it, his statement, as far as the way that it reaches us, states, these were the two vehicles that I saw while we were there. What we don't, what we don't know and what we, we cannot tell from that statement is, what exactly does that mean? Does that mean that these two vehicles were parked in the parking lot when you arrived? Were they parked in the parking lot while you were in the store? Were they parked in the parking lot when you left? This is going to take us up to December 20th, 2003. This is 11 days before the four-year anniversary of that terrible day when Amy was taken away. And a a long-awaited announcement was made on this day. The O'Fallon authorities charged a suspect in the 1999 East Illinois University students murder. It took a messy divorce and a strange ex-wife and almost four years to finally make an arrest in this case. Edward Scott Phillips, 37 years old, who also went by the names of Ed and Eddie was charged with first degree murder. Police were looking at Edward Scott Phillips for about two and a half weeks, very quietly. Right. before actually charging him and announcing that they were charging him with this murder to the public. Edward Scott Phillips was already in prison, serving time on unrelated charges of burglary, perjury, and obstructing justice. It looks like all of those charges are in direct relation to Edward's ex-wife and their messy divorce. Mm-hmm. From my understanding, Captain, I think she had moved on. They were divorced. Edward clearly had not moved on. And he had broken into her home, broken into the home of the person he believed to be his ex-wife's boyfriend. And he had left threatening messages and threatening calls to both individuals. So he's eventually picked up and charged and put in uh, jail or prison for those charges. So he's already locked up and had been for a period of time before police get to him to talk to him about Amy's case. Now, before all of that mess, Edward worked for the Illinois Department of Corrections, for which he drove a truck delivering food to different prisons. Now, <laughs> the tip that comes out that leads law enforcement to their suspect after all of these years really came out of the blue, completely out of the blue. The arrest came by way of a tip called in from Edward's ex-wife, Dawn. She passed along her suspicions to her attorney, her divorce attorney at the time, who then began talking with police. What police learned was that Edward owned a 38 caliber gun at the time of the murder. And that that night, the night in question, Edward came home with blood on his clothes, which at the time he had told his wife that his clothes were bloody because he was forced to move a dead animal off of the road. Sounds fishy. Now, Edward also fits the description, no matter how much one argues how vague it is or not vague. Right. He fits the description of the person that the police were looking for as either a witness or suspect that last customer. Well, it probably took her a minute to come forward too, because once he's in jail or prison, like you said, maybe she felt safe enough to go to her attorney and say, Hey, this guy should be looked at in this crime. I think that's what you have here. I think that you have this wife who was suspicious of, about this situation all along, never brought it to anybody's attention until she felt like I don't have to worry about this guy doing something to me. 
the general description that we get of Edward now, mind keep it keep in mind this is four years after the the homicide at the time of his arrest. He's five foot eight inches tall, fits the height. He's roughly 210 pounds with brown hair and hazel eyes. Now, at the time of the murder, he lived about 130 miles roughly from the crime scene. Wow. Now, this is weird, Captain, because when asked by detectives about the day in question, Edward Scott Phillips says he was the, quote, last customer that they had been looking for. But he goes on to tell them, I did not kill Amy. So detectives go and talk to this guy, Edward Phillips, who was already in prison at the time anyway. Again, his charges weren't particularly serious offenses compared to the other cases we have discussed here today. Right, but what is, what is his reason for buying these leotards? Well, at the time, I and I, I can't tell you what he told police because I don't know. We don't have those statements. But at the right. time of Amy's murder, Edward Phillips lived with his wife, Dawn, and his daughter in Mount Sterling, Illinois. So he admits that he was at the dance store that day. Okay, well, this has got to make the detectives extremely suspicious right from Jump Street, right? Because here you have been asking the public for help in the case for damn near four years. And at no point does this guy come forward and say, hey, I was there that day. This is what I know. I would like to help this poor family, the police and the community. But instead, no, he chose to do nothing. Well, and like you said, he lived over 130 miles away. So right out of the gate with this guy, you're already... You already know one of two things. Either this guy is a soulless, gutless loser, or he's your killer. Now, look, even or the both. devil hates a loser. So if I'm in there questioning this guy, I'm thinking he's probably both. He's everything we just said, and he's probably our guy. Right. His general story, Captain, was that he drove out of town to attend, I believe he said, a gun show. But there was something that he drove to this area and he was looking, to, he, he had a destination that was not the dance store. Right. He couldn't find that destination. So he decides to turn around and start heading home. And when he heads home, he sees this dance store and he thinks that he's going to stop in and buy something for his daughter. I do not like the cut of this guy's gym. <laughs> well, it gets, it gets so much worse. So he, he already tells police that, yes, I, I was in the store that day. But you gotta, you gotta listen. If you pay, if you don't pay any attention to anything else that we've said so far today in this case, pay attention to this. Not only does he tell police, yes, I was the last customer that was in the store that day. I I'm the guy that you were looking for, uh, as far as that final charge on the register, the final sale on the register that was recorded. But he says, Hey, I was in the store on that day in question by myself. I bought something for my daughter. Then I left the store a short time later. I returned to the store because I decided to return the item or exchange the item. He says that when he arrived, he couldn't find the store clerk. Instead, he finds a trail of blood. He follows the trail, which leads him eventually to Amy's body. He says that he then panicked because he had an unregistered firearm in his possession on that day. Mm -hmm. So he decides to flee the scene, drives back to his home in Mount Sterling, again, about 130 miles away and disposing of the unregistered pistol along the way. He gets home and his wife sees blood on his pants. He says, I have got blood on my clothing because I had to move a dead animal off the road. That gun that Edward disposed of and the murder weapon, which I and many others firmly believe to be one in the same has never been located. Right. After Phillips and his wife, Dawn, got divorced, they were in this heated child custody battle. And that's when Dawn told her attorney, the attorney tells the police about the blood stains on Edward's pants on the night of December 31st, 1999. This, of course, leading them to question him. So, unfortunately, the wait continued for those seeking justice for Amy. The trial against this scumbag took some time to get to Edward entered a plea of not guilty at trial. Prosecutors showed the members of the jury, an empty box for 38 caliber pistol bullets found in Phillips home. 
which would match the small caliber bullets that killed Amy Bloomberg. And the prosecution had a man testify, a man who knew Edward Phillips. This man testified that he sold a pistol to Edward and the prosecution had the bill of sale with Edward's signature on it in evidence. So this gun that he admits was unregistered, he has it on him at the time of the murder and he disposes of it shortly after Amy is killed, Mm -hmm. matches the caliber that killed our victim. And we have proof positive from his own words and from this gentleman who sold him the gun and kept this bill of sale with Edward's signature on it all of these years later. And like you said, law enforcement was looking for this last customer for years, never comes forward. And then when they actually do talk to him, he's like, oh, well, not only was I the last customer, I went back in and I saw that she was murdered and I I didn't come forward. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell anybody. So you want to talk about put, painting yourself into a corner. That's exactly what this knobhead did. And there's going to be some people that will say, oh, man, I, I can see why he panicked and he just kind of freaked out. And yeah, maybe he wasn't thinking clearly, but here's the thing. At the end of the day, they have the evidence to match the bullet to the gun that killed this poor young woman. Even if you are in possession of a firearm with you that day, they can very quickly go, yep, that doesn't match the bullet that killed this young woman. Right. So just, just by having a gun doesn't make you guilty of anything. You could have, if he was innocent, which he's clearly not, uh, he, he could have helped in this situation. Well, and he doesn't know what the actual murder weapon is, or he shouldn't, if he's innocent, he shouldn't know. So it could be a nine millimeter or a 22 See what I'm saying? So the fact that he would get rid of his gun when you don't even know what the murder weapon would be if you were innocent. Right. Not, not to mention the fact that there would be, uh, intricate markings on that would be able to tell exactly which gun fired that bullet. Now, despite what the defense called only circumstantial evidence, the jury only needed 24 hours of deliberation. And on May 29, 2007, Edward Phillips was found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to 55 years in prison without parole at sentencing. Edward Phillips, who declined to testify at trial, turned to Amy's parents and told them, quote, I did. I didn't kill your daughter. If you didn't commit this crime, you wouldn't be freaking out. You call 911. They come. You have an unregistered gun. And then you tell them, do a ballistic test. I never shot my gun today. Well, and what's interesting here too, even all of these years later is that, well, Amy's case, while it was looked at and in consideration to be a part of the series of the I-70 killers cases, well, that cannot be the case if Edward Scott Phillips is not the I-70 killer. Because Edward Scott Phillips, regardless of what he said to Amy's parents, I believe, and so do everybody else, including that jury, the only people that matter, they believe he is the killer. And I think that you could, the defense can call it whatever they want, circumstantial evidence, whatever. It looks to me like a pretty good mountain of evidence convicted this guy and they found their right guy. Now, for some quick follow-up on the I-70 killer case, our longtime listeners know that we covered the case in depth over two years ago. If anybody would like to go back and listen to those episodes, that's true crime garage episodes 441 and 442 from November of 2020. Great Sem- episodes. If I'd say so myself, thank you. You did a, you did an excellent job. I, I mean, your part was okay, but my part it was some of my best work. My part was lacking at best lackluster as, as some of the reviews stated. Since then, there has been some movement on the I-70 cases. In October of 2021, we get updated suspect composite sketches. Now, a little bit more of my rant here, Captain. This is the part where I have a big problem. WTHR, who I know does some great work. I've read a lot of their articles over the years, but this is where they... This was very disappointing to me because they titled their article 
Authorities with St. Charles Police Department in Missouri released age-enhanced photos of the suspected I-70 killer. These are not photos. Nobody would look at these and go, those are photos. But again, the masses sometimes have trouble understanding and, and comprehending exactly what's going on. And if you tell them that they're photos, there are going to be some people out there that believe that these are photos. These are sketches that they are releasing to the public of an unknown individual sketches of an unknown individual will never be as accurate as a photo. So I think it's just, I think it's poor reporting to call them photos. Yeah, definitely poor reporting, which you don't get on this show. I don't want it to make it. I don't want to seem like we're coming down hard on people that see an image and go, well, that could be my neighbor or that looks kind of like my uncle. And maybe he was responsible because again, when people go out of their way to actually call in, call in these tips, their gut is telling them I, I, I should call in because worst case scenario, I'm wrong. But if I don't call in, they don't have this information. So I know that there's a lot of people out there that see these sketches. I mean, that's one of the reasons why in the Delphi case, they said, Hey, stop comparing these people online. That's, that's not going to help the case any. And I would argue in the Delphi case that the man they arrested does not look much like the first composite sketch or the second composite sketch. Maybe he looks somewhere, he, to me, looks somewhere in between. The following month, a month after we get these updated suspect composite sketches, uh, in November of 2021, Terre Haute police announced that the I-70 killer was a possible suspect in a 2001 murder of a liquor store clerk. His name was Billy Brossman. The crime went down like this on the evening of November 30th, 2001. Brossman was working alone at the 7th and 70 liquor store in Terre Haute, Indiana. Security camera footage showed a white male suspect enter the store and pull a gun on Brossman and rob the cash register. The footage then showed the suspect lead Brosman to the back of the store and murder him with a single shot to the back of the head. The murder of Brosman occurred just seven blocks from the murder of Michael McCown and was similar in MO to the I-70 murders. Unlike in the I-70 murders, though, we have security footage of Brosman's killer that exists and police have stated that they have a person of interest in the case. So they're, they're telling us, hey, the this could be connected. It also may not be if this person of interest pans out and he is not tied to any of these other killings. Then we get this intriguing update from KMOV News 4 that reads, the person identified earlier this week as the I-65 serial killer is now being looked at as a possible suspect in the I-70 murders, with a local task force scrambling to compare notes with police authorities in Indiana. So this would be information from last year, Captain. And they go on to say that Indiana State Police have announced that numerous pieces of DNA evidence tied Harry Edward Greenwell to three motel highway killings in Indiana and Kentucky between 1987 and 1990. The I-70 killings happened just two years later, as we know, in 1992. Greenwell, this guy who they already know killed three people, died of cancer in 2013 at the age of 68. The I-65 killer was also known as the Days Inn killer. His uh, first victim was at a Super 8 motel in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, before he killed again at the Days Inn in Merrillville, Indiana, and then finally at the Remington, Indiana Days Inn. Police say Greenwell attacked a fourth victim later at the Days Inn in Columbia, Indiana, but she survived and gave police a composite sketch, which matched Greenwell. Quote, we are talking with the Indiana Task Force, said Detective Raymond Floyd, who is heading up the St. Louis Task Force investigating the I-70 murders. Right now, it's preliminary, but there are definitely some similarities, and we are going to pursue them. Also last year in 2022, 
we get confirmation that DNA evidence exists in the I-70 killer case and was sent away for testing. Police have said that DNA testing results were back. They received the results back last year. They had some material from the April 1992 Terre Haute case. This was the murder of Michael McCown that had DNA evidence on it. They sent it out for testing last year. They get this uh, results back. However, due to the active investigation, investigators are not sharing the results currently from that testing because they have said several other agencies, other police agencies and other jurisdictions have evidence that is currently being processed or will be processed and tested soon. So the police are reminding the public and all of these jurisdictions that involve the I-70 cases that they're refusing to call the I-70 cases cold. And I say rightfully so. Look at all the activity in these cases. It looks more and more likely that maybe even 30 years later that we are finally going to get some answers in some of these still unsolved homicide cases. All I got to say is winner, winner, chicken dinner. If it's confirmed, like you said it is, that they have DNA, that gives me a lot of hope that the I-70 serial killer case could be solved in 2023. Again, we want to thank you for an awesome 2022. Onward and upward in 2023. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful listeners? First one of the year. This week we are recommending The Shadow of Death, The Hunt for the Connecticut River Valley Killer, available in paperback, Kindle, and now audiobook on Audible. This is by Peter Ginsburg, and it's a complete breakdown of the Connecticut River Valley Killer case, which was one of the last cases we covered here in the garage at the end of last year. So check out The Shadow of Death, The Hunt for the Connecticut River Valley Killer by Peter Ginsburg. And if you are driving or if you are at the gym and you can't write down that title, always know that you can go to our website, truecrimegarage.com, click on the recommended tab, and you will find that great title there for you along with many more. Yes, and we'll see you back in the True Crime Garage Batcave next week. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.